Mayor Pete Buttigieg, uh, good to see you uh, here in South Bend in the old Studebaker plant where you announced your candidacy. I think it's fair to say that as this year begun, uh, people would, outside of South Bend, would not be able to recognize your name, much less uh, pronounce it. And safe to say. this has been quite a, a rocket ride for you. You just uh, improbably turned in one of the biggest fundraising quarters in uh, Democratic Party history. Uh, do you ever step back and say, how the hell did this happen? Yeah, there's not that much time to step back, but uh, when I do, it, it is extraordinary. Obviously, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't believe we could win, believe in our message, and believe in the campaign. But uh, our plan was to have a slow burn to try to assert that we belonged in the race, period. Uh, over the spring and into the summer and then hope to break out in the debates. What we found instead is that the message caught fire early. Uh, now the challenge for us is to make sure that we're really reaching everybody with it and that we have the kind of ground organization it takes to actually win. It's a high class problem. It's a great problem to have. We started out with four people. Uh, in a tiny office here in, in South Bend at the beginning of this year. And now we're, uh, uh, we're around a couple hundred and growing fast. You were sort of a sensation in March and April. It's been a little uh, more rugged going lately. Your poll numbers have dropped a little. Is there any concern that, hey, I gotta win next winter and I don't wanna win March and April of the year before? Well, you, you definitely don't want to uh, have your best moments too early in the race. But what we've seen is, uh, uh, you know, we arrived in, in a kind of very swift fashion, and, and now uh, we've carved out a place in, uh, in, in the leading group. Um, but in order to stay there, we've got to earn that. We've got to earn it every day. You wrote in your book here, you were talking about running for mayor as a 29-year-old. The reason to run, the ideal reason to seek any job was clear. The city's needs matched what I had to offer. What about you matches this moment and the presidency of the United States. Well, I think we've got a moment where the country needs something new, uh, needs an answer to these changes that are accelerating, that are getting away from a lot of Americans. They have people in communities like mine wondering whether there's a place for them in the future, which is one of the reasons why the, the president came along selling a certain message, which was, I'm going to turn back the clock and nothing's going to change at all. That message is false, but we've got to have one that uh, is just as responsive to that sense of turn without making an impossible promise to turn back the clock. My story is that of somebody who belongs to the generation that has so much at stake in whether we can resolve economic change uh, and master it to make it work for us, whether we can resolve climate change, whether we can deliver racial equality in our time. Uh, and I also come from the region that has struggled the most with these kinds of changes and the region that my own party, the Democratic Party, has lately struggled to connect with in a way that helped lead to this presidency. Uh, I'm a product of the times that we're living in. I'm a veteran of the war in Afghanistan. I think all of these things, plus the experience that I've had on the ground guiding a city up against colossal challenges, adds up to a, a different package of, of experience uh, and a different uh, uh, messenger, but also a different message than any of the others are offering. You're 37 years old. You're two years over the constitutional minimum uh, for serving as president. And, and you obviously feel that's a virtue. Yeah, very much so. I think uh, you're seeing it around the world, actually. There are a lot of leaders from El Salvador to France to New Zealand who have been part of this generation, uh, would be the same age or younger uh, than I would be taking office in 2021. And ordinarily, the arrival of a new generation of leadership is the kind of thing that America leads. Right now, it seems like we're playing catch up, but I do see uh, on the trail, by the way, not just among younger voters, but among voters of all ages, a desire to, to bring forward new voices because when I get to the age of the current president in the 2050s, my generation is going to be held to account for whether we tackled these issues in these years that, that are coming upon us right now. Implicit in that is that the president won't be here in 2050 and perhaps has less of a stake in that you've got two opponents who are older than he is. Should age be an issue for them? I think that any candidate of any age can put forward a compelling message and be a great president. But I do think I come at these issues differently because I do have a, a personal expectation, Lord willing, of, of being around uh, in the years when we're going to know whether or not the actions we took right now 
2019, 2020, 2021, got the job done on protecting our future economy from climate change, whether we got the job done on having a rising tide actually lift all boats, which has not happened for most Americans. And if we don't act now to resolve that, then the entire balance of my adult life uh, will be spent in a period of, of decline and despair for this country when actually uh, we have the, the possibility of having our best moments yet as a country. In, in a certain way, it feels like your, your energy has gotten out ahead of your ideas on this one. We still haven't really heard uh, that sort of big economic uh, package, that, that, that big clarifying idea about how you're, go you're going to achieve this. Well, I've tried to be very clear on where I stand on every important issue of our time, including economics. So what's the most important thing to do to make good on that promise to these, uh, to these folks who have been on the other side of that digital divide? What is the promise for them? It's two sets of things. Uh, the first set is deceptively simple. It's things like making sure people get paid more. We need to raise the minimum wage. Sometimes we think of these convoluted policy mechanisms uh, to solve what we think are complicated problems. It's why minimum wage needs to go above $15 But this isn't, an this hour. is an idea it's, that every Democratic candidate supports, sure. so it's not uniquely your So this idea. brings me to the more complicated okay. ideas. But, but uh, I do think it's important to recognize that most Democrats agree on a lot of these ideas, and it's okay. Uh, the question then becomes, you know, what kind of messenger can deliver those in a way that keeps our focus on what's actually at hand? versus getting diverted into talking about the president so much that we're not talking about you. Now, there are other things you aren't hearing about as much from other campaigns. Uh, part of that is uh, the extent to which our benefit system needs to be decoupled from this system we have now that still pretty much assumes that you're going to have the same career or even the same employer for your whole working life. That is not true for most people in my generation, anybody younger than me. That has some very specific implications in economic policy. For example, when we're talking about how you re accrue retirement savings or unemployment insurance or uh, various benefits uh, from health to family leave, we are also going to have to be very creative economically in making sure that the way we support not just jobs but workers adds up in the 21st century. And uh, we also need, I think, to be much more intentional and specific in our plans for black Americans. That's why I've proposed a Douglas plan that ought to be as ambitious as the Marshall Plan well, that we built Europe, uh, let, but let needs me, to have specificity and intention. Let, let's stop right there, because one of the things that happens is you, you know, one of the uh, distinctions you earn when you become a hot candidate is greater scrutiny. Mm. And, uh, uh, and that has happened with you. And, a lot of it has been around this issue of race. You know, I remember watching your announcement from this room, uh, and I was struck by the fact that in a city that is 40% uh, black and Hispanic, uh, you had 5,000 people here, very few uh, faces of color uh, in this room. And, and this has come back recently because of uh, a tragic uh, police-involved shooting here uh, of a, a black man that is still murky under investigation. It stirred the community, and some of that anger was directed at you. Why is it taking so long? These are issues for you. Yeah, of course. And when you're in charge, you bear responsibility for everything that happens, good or bad, on your watch. I can point to the success we've had in uh, reducing the poverty rate, but there are also a lot of areas where I can't claim that we've solved the problem. Uh, I think the important thing is to recognize that this is happening in the context of patterns of exclusion that are economic, uh, as well as across health, education, and, and, national. and justice, and national but, but, challenges. But here's my question. You're a data guy. Yeah. Um, the, if you look at the number of black police officers going from uh, 25 to 13 yeah. uh, on your watch, if you look at um, uh, minority business enterprises and contracting the city less than 1%, aren't those warning signs for people? Does, don't, don't, th those are things that should be under your control. Well, uh, some of these things are incredibly challenging, and, and the recruiting is a good example. So it's not like we uh, are just now coming awake to the problem of uh, hiring and retaining black officers on the police department. Uh, we actually started uh, publishing our own data so that uh, everybody could look in and see how many applicants we attract in the first, attract in the first place and where we lose them along the way. Uh, we've conducted job fairs. I've, I've stood in, in, in front of the cameras pleading with community members to help more people uh, 
uh, apply and then uh, help try to help make sure they succeed. Uh, we're not the only community facing a racial gap in police recruitment and retention too. Uh, the profession as a whole has become harder to attract people to and that's even more true uh, in many cities including mine uh, when it comes to minority recruitment. So I'll own up to the fact that we have the having of the number is, is, uh, is kind of it's six yeah, percent of, of the entire force, yeah. 25 percent, 24, 25 percent of the population is yeah. Is African what about on the minority contracting because you're talking about you're making speeches and I know you believe deeply in them about uh, boosting minority entrepreneurship around the country you have this Douglas plan but it, it was kind of stunning to me to see that small a number of contracts in the city yeah. going to a minority owned Enterprise. Yeah, so the reason that number's out there is because we took a look to find out what it was, knowing that, that it wouldn't be a great number. But when I arrived, we didn't even have the ability to assess uh, how we were doing at doing business with the minority contractors. We said, okay, we've got to fix that. Now we're at a stage where we're saying, okay, how do we set better targets? But legally, we're uh, not able to do that until we conduct a study of all the disparities. So that's underway. It's going to be delivered. It's been in the works for a while. And it's going to be delivered this summer. Uh, again, these are not issues that, uh, uh, that were created on my watch, but I'm determined to make sure that they improve on my watch. And there are many indicators that are getting better, some that aren't, and we're honest about that. Um, but we try to make sure that people at least know where we stand, what the reality is, and then the steps that we are taking in order to drive progress.